Well, hello everyone. My name is Dan Wenzel. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the making of a component guide. So just an agenda. We'll start off with a history of the component guide, talk about what it is and how it came about specifically in my company. Um, we'll then spend probably a bulk of uh, the presentation with the live demo. I like to live dangerously. Um, we're going to actually build a component guide on the fly uh, from scratch tonight. And then we'll go, go back to some final thoughts and then if we have time at the end we'll do some Q&A. Alright, so to start off with the history of the component guide, we really need to go back further and just a quick history of me. So uh, I grew up and spent most of my life in Wisconsin. Um, and while I was there, I had one passion and one passion only, and that was music. And I was absolutely convinced that I would be, become a rock star. Here's an old picture of me in my long hair days playing drums. You can just see the ambition just oozing off of my face. Uh, it was fun, exciting times. Unfortunately, the rock star dream didn't pan out. So I found a second passion in technology and programming and moved out to San Francisco to learn how to be a web developer. And that is where I landed a job at PagerDuty. Many of you know PagerDuty. Many of you have been woken up by PagerDuty. Uh, it's an incident resolution platform. Um, recently, I moved uh, here to the Austin area uh, and I am now working remotely for PagerDuty. Uh, Duty and um, they are remote friendly and we're actually hiring um, another member of our front end team. So if anyone is interested, if you like the idea of working from home, working in Ember, uh, at a more established company doing some really cool things, come talk to me at the end. It's at PagerDuty where I learned all about Ember. So I had worked in Backbone previously and we are actually uh, migrating our front end from Backbone to Ember. And so um, I learned all about the Ember way and fell in love with the framework. Um, and so much so that it kind of became my focus uh, at my job, working on the continuing migration, building up of a strong Ember architecture uh, centered around reusable components, which is Ember is all about, as, we, as most of us know. So I fell in love with the framework and also fell in love with the Ember community. Um, and in particular, uh, March of last year, went to EmberConf in Portland. How many of you were there? EmberConf? Yeah. How many of you are going to be here there this year? Awesome. Yeah. It's an awesome, awesome uh, event. Lots of really great speakers. And one that really stood out for me is this uh, presentation. This is Chris Lopresto. He gave a, a talk on a living style guide. So I highly encourage you, uh, many of you probably saw this uh, talk, but um, highly encourage you to go check out this talk. Some really, really cool stuff in there. Um, I'll only gloss over some of that stuff, but um, the, the main idea is most of us have had exposure to a style guide where it's basically a static document that holds some information about what your standards are for you know, things like fonts and colors and what you know, your, your markups should look like, all that cool stuff. Oftentimes these things become out of date. Maybe you've been working at your company for two years and you dig up a style guide and you didn't realize it existed. Like, oh, what is this thing? Um, it can easily become out of date. And so Chris here talks about this idea of a living style guide, which actually uses the live presentation code base. So it actually uses the code itself to drive the style guide. And so it just naturally stays up to date. So I was really, really inspired by this. It really resonated with me, and in particular, how this can kind of bridge the gap between UX and engineers, um, allowing everyone to kind of speak the same language and having a tool that facilitates that. And then in particular, um, there is, in the Ember world, uh, Chris wrote this Ember uh, add-on called Ember Freestyle, which we're going to look at today, which makes it really, really easy to build out a living style guide into your Ember app. So I'm really inspired, went back to my job, went back to the things that I was doing. Um, but the cool thing about PagerDuty is once a month we have a hack day. Uh, so we spend a Friday doing whatever we want to do. And so it's a really cool opportunity to kind of experiment with new things. And so I thought perfect opportunity for me to try out a component guide. 
and try implementing it into the uh, PagerDuty's Ember app. And so I did, fired it up. It was real simple and easy with the Ember Freestyle. It does a, so much for you, and we're going to see that. Fired it up, made a couple of components. Went really well. Seemed to resonate with everyone when I presented it at Hack Day, and I won Hack Day for the internal tools category. <laughs> so that meant that uh, not only did I get a nice, shiny plastic trophy, um, uh, it meant that the winners of the hack day get to actually develop their hack into production. So slowly but surely, the priority increased for the component guide. We ended up doing an audit of all of the reusable components that were out there in our Ember application and, and slowly but surely built them all into the component guide. Recently, I presented at an all hands, basically saying like, for all intents and purposes, the component guide is complete. So you should start to use it. Um, and we'll talk more about specifically what that means uh, at the end here. And we're slowly starting to see adoption. After the meeting, you started to hear a lot of chatter and, and ideas about different components, just started to see them in use. And in particular, started to see bug tickets come in. So that's a good sign that people are using your stuff, right? Is that you're starting to get bug tickets. Better than not seeing anything at all. All right, so enough talk. Let's get into the live demo. I wanted to show you just what this component guide is all about. So rather than uh, expose the deep, dark secrets of PagerDuty code, um, I thought we would spend some time building out a component guide for an Ember open source app. And we're going to build a component guide for Ember Observer, which itself is an Ember app. Most of us have probably seen Ember Observer. It is a, basically a, a directory uh, of all of the Ember add-ons that are out there um, with, uh, that are scored. And so they, they have this really cool kind of algorithm for scoring out and, and, and ranking these. It's a really cool way to find Ember add-ons. And, and again, it's an Ember app. So I'd like to build a component guide for Ember Observer. So first thing is, uh, I went ahead and forked the repo and fired up my Ember server. So here we have localhost 4200. And it looks like Ember Observer. So it's already kind of working. So they must use like external API even in the de development side. Um, so that's cool. We got it fired up. Let's take a look at Ember Freestyle, the documentation here, just to see kind of how we get started. So here we see an installation, just like a lot of Ember add-ons, most Ember add-ons. Real easy to install, just an Ember install. Automatically gives you a Freestyle template, a Freestyle controller and some CSS, and I went ahead and added a route to my app in Ember Observer, so I can actually go and visit slash freestyle. And we're already gonna have it loaded in place. Now, for some reason, let me take a look at my Ember app. I may have stalled since we started here today. Let me go ahead and restart it. So one thing I'll, I'll point out while that's loading, um, so you'll notice it's just another route inside of your Ember application. All I did was did Ember install freestyle, added this route, and we now have, um, we have this visual style and this color palette. This, these are just two things that are automatically included in freestyle. You can edit them if you want to, put in your own stuff, uh, fonts and colors and whatnot. But I want to jump right into creating a component. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, for those of you who aren't too familiar with Ember, Ember is all about components, and really most uh, JavaScript frameworks these days. And so what we're seeing here, even though it's a single page, um, it's all made up of different components all over this page. And I'll even show you. Let's go ahead and pop into the Ember inspector. Slide this over here. And awesome. Okay, so we'll use our little magnifying glass and we'll be able to see all of the different components that are kind of this app is built into. And all good Ember apps will be built like this, just all made up of components, nice uh, isolated sections of code. And so we're gonna build out, I'd like to build out the component guide and the first component I like to use is this, um, basically this add on list item here. So let's hover over and let's take a look. Looks like the name of this component is called add-on details. So this is going to be the first component I'm gonna build into my component guide. 
So how do we do that? What do we do? Let's go back to Ember Freestyle, the uh, README here, and let's take a look. Okay, here is the key for just putting a component into your component guide. You just use this freestyle usage wrapper. You use a globally unique a slug, they call it, or identifier. Give it a title, and then on the inside, you put an actual component, just like you would put it in any template. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So this is the way that the uh, freestyle template looks now. This is basically that visual style stuff you saw with the fonts and the colors. And I'm going to add an actual component section. Now, rather than type out code tonight, that would be torture. Uh, I'm going to just press magic buttons today. Voila. OK. So what I did was add another section called the UI elements. And then again, there's this freestyle usage wrapper, which is just something that comes with freestyle. And on the very inside, I have the actual component itself. Now, uh, I took a look at add-on details, and it turns out you have to pass in an actual add-on object. So that's what I did. What I, what I did was I created an add-on stub. And just right in my JavaScript in the component guide uh, itself, I just created a little stub object here. So I put in a name, description, and ranking, because I saw that's kind of the, the uh, core information that you need in your add-on. So that's, that's a sign of a good component so far, is that you're able to just kind of pass the data in, and it should look good. Let's take a look. Pop back in here. Cool. All right, so we have a UI element section. I'll get rid of that other stuff. And here is our title, and here is the component itself. So all we did was pop that in there, and it's already showing up our, on our component guide. And another thing is, you'll notice that it actually shows a little code snippet of what, the, what it's going to look like when you put that into your template. So that is really cool because it shows anyone, even if people don't know Ember, how to actually use this. And they could you know, send a ticket to you and say, hey, I want you to build add-on details. And they could copy and paste this into, into their ticket. Really cool stuff. Some of you with good eyes may have noticed something doesn't look quite right, though, with this. If we look at the real Ember Observer and look at these list items, they look a little different. Not only that you might have like actual numbers over here, we'll talk about that later, but in particular, just sort of the overall styling doesn't look quite right. It should be all in line, and there should be this nice blue when you hover over it, changes the background to blue, and mine's not doing that. Something's not quite right here with the styling. Let's inspect one of these elements in the real site and see what's going on here. So if I inspect, I'm going to make this bigger for you folks. So taking a look over at the CSS, ah, it looks like the actual style comes from this dot add-on list and then nested in that an li. And that's where the styles are coming from. And so in particular, if we actually look down here at the markup, yeah, so we've got a UL class add-on list. And then nested in that, we have an li. And then within that is where our actual component is. So this is why we weren't seeing the right styling, because the component itself was inside here. The CSS depends on the component being inside of this particular uh, format here, dot add on list li. That's not going to work. So, and in fact, let's take a look at the, the style sheet for that. Yeah, there we go. So dot add on list, and then nested in that, everything is defined inside this li. So one simple thing we could do to fix this is let's just go ahead and wrap this in a ul and an li, just like how we saw it. So let's do that quick. Magic button. Cool. So UL, we got the right class. Inside of that, we've got the LI. Let's take a look. Nice. We got it. So we've got the hover, the blue background. The, we've got it all in line. Looks cool. Awesome. So we just fixed our component guide and everything's good. Well, there's something I don't like about this. Something just doesn't feel right. First of all, you'll notice in our snippet, it's actually showing you that UL and that LI. And technically, this is correct, because the component guide is supposed to say, this is how you build this component. And we've, we've discovered that in order to build it and make it look right, it does indeed need to be inside this UL, which is uh, and inside of that the LI. So basically, we have to say in our component guide, 
not only do you use the component and define it this way, but you have to also put it in, in, into this particular structure. We might even need to put like some comments into our component guide to sort of explain that. But doesn't that feel a little messy? Doesn't it all feel a little kind of weird that we have to do that? And so I would argue that we have just exposed an opportunity for refactoring this component. Really, if this was a, a nicely isolated component, all of the styles would be defined in the component itself and not be dependent on these uh, external uh, HTML elements. So I'm actually going to refactor this component. So let's go back. First thing I'm going to do is get rid of that UL and that LI again. I don't like that. Next, I've gone ahead and added a class to the component previously that did not have a class at all, I'm calling it add-on details. And then I refactored my CSS to where now everything is defined under that dot add on details. We could even take it a step further and create a separate CSS file that's uh, in the same directory as the component itself. That'd probably be the next step. But the main idea here is that all of the CSS now is defined in this one selector, which basically represents the component itself. So it's now all in the same context. And so without a UL and an LI in my component guide, there we go. Looks cool. So it looks exactly the way it's supposed to. We no longer have that mess in our uh, actual snippet here. It looks a lot cleaner. So not only is the component guide in better shape, but I would say that we actually took advantage of the component guide, and this happens a lot. As you're building out a component into the guide, you realize because things are getting messy with the way that you're trying to build it, there must be something not quite right with the component. And so it oftentimes brings up opportunities for refactoring, which is really, really cool. OK, let's take this to the next step. So we've got this little question mark here. Uh, the only thing we've added, uh, passed into this component, is this add-on stub, which is just a few little properties to it. Let's take this to the next level. And this is where we get into the concept of variance. So let's scroll down here, the readme. Here we go. So this talks about the concept of having a collection and within your collection having separate variants. And I'll show you what that means. Let me pop back into my code here. All right. So let's create a variant. So now we have a collection with the title add-on details. And then within that block, we have two variants. Now, you'll notice inside the freestyle variant uh, block, we just have what we had before with that freestyle usage. And within the freestyle usage, we have the actual component itself. This one was what we were already working with, just a simple add-on details, add-on equals add-on stub. Now we have a second variant. I called it show ranking. And all I did was just the same, except I passed an additional property in called show ranking equals true. I looked at the component and realized that there's that Boolean and just wondering what, what, what happens if I actually set show ranking to true. So let's see what that looks like. Nice. So now we have two different versions of our component in our component guide here. And we can see what that difference is. Oh, I see. So putting show ranking to equal to true means that this little number is going to show up as opposed to just this little question mark. So now we are able to kind of compare and contrast different options for right within our component guide, which is really, really nice. Now, let's take another look at the real Ember Observer. There's a lot more going on here. How do we get these numbers and these colors? How do we get some of these have little stars by them? What's going on here? So I went ahead and inspected, uh, dug a little bit deeper into the component itself, and it turns out there are all sorts of different properties going on. And so what I could do is just create a whole bunch of variants, like maybe like 10 variants, one for each of the properties. And in fact, really, if I wanted to, to display all possible combinations of things that could go on, I probably need like close to 100 variants. Because what happens if one Boolean is true and one is false, or this third one is true, and all sorts of different combinations, it just becomes too much to grasp. And, and be way too crazy to build up variants for every single combination. So here is where I was really thinking, I need, I need something, something more here. 
wouldn't it be cool if you could customize a component right on the component guide? So let me show you what I did. So let's try this. Boom. So I went ahead and created a new addition to Freestyle. It's called Freestyle Custom Variant. And what I did was passed in a set of custom properties. We'll see what those look like in just a second. Um, and then on the inside of that, again, our old friend Freestyle Usage. It now has, uh, it's, it's a title, uh, it, excuse me, it's a, it's a custom variant. So it's going to show that in the title. And then we have our component here, add on details, except now we have all these different properties I've passed in. And the values of these properties come from that custom properties. So what does that look like? Looks like this. So custom properties, just a JavaScript object. Each of the keys represents the name of a property. And then we pass in what becomes a default value. So what we want it to show as initially. Um, the default type is a text box, but if you want it to be like a, for a Boolean, you can put input type checkbox. And then if you want to, you can put a description as well. So this custom properties object is going to do two things. Number one, we already saw we can use them to pass those initial values in to this variant in the, in the component guide. But the second thing it does, I will show you now. Bam. So what we have, zoom in a little bit. So what the custom properties did is it took every one of those properties and turned them in entry, helps so many future uh, engineers. And you saw just how easy it was to plug it in. Uh, and then similarly, maybe you see a component in the component guide. This will work, except I need it to be tweaked a little bit. Maybe I need mine to be, have a black background or rounded corners or something. Um, you can just go ahead and edit your component like you normally would, make, you know, make new properties or new options or new customization. And then, again, one add step to the workflow, go ahead and add it to the component guide and say, all right, here's a new property. Um, here's a new option for you for future developers so that they know what you just did. And you can see how that kind of all stays up to date as opposed to one developer putting something into a component but nobody knows about it. The next time somebody has to do that, maybe they'll reinvent the wheel. So this really prevents all, uh, a lot of that stuff from happening. Now the second user, second main user of the component guide is for UX designers. And the first two bullets here are just the same. So think in components. As you are writing up your specs, um, check the component guide and see if the thing that you have is, is already in there. And then the, the really cool thing is you can refer to components in your specs. So what do I mean by that? I'll show you. Um, this is an example of something we might have seen in the past where we have a ticket, build this thing, here's a mock-up. If we're lucky, we've got some annotation over there for some specific CSS. Most of the time, probably not. We're basically just given a mock-up and say, build this thing, figure it out. And so we would be charged as an engineer with translating this into, okay, well, how, do, how does that work? How do I build it into HTML? What kind of CSS am I going to use? And it can be all over the place. And we've all experienced that, I'm sure. So the future is, with the component guide, is something like this, where we have mockups now which specifically call out components that are going to be used in there. So build this thing, but that little guy there is PD Avatar. And is circular is true. So you saw in the component guide, we actually had the snippets. So a UX designer could look at the component guide, figure out which properties they want, copy, paste it right into their mockups. So then as an engineer, it's so nice, instead of having to, to wrap my head around how I'm going to build this thing, be like, oh, that's PD avatar. That's PD tip. And then you just pop that right in and you know exactly how to do it. So finally, just some points I really wanted to make about the component guide. And some of these I actually pulled from Chris's presentation. Uh, some benefits of the component guide. So we've already talked about a lot of them. Uh, a component guide enforces standards of style. So UX really loves consistency. The, you want to have, if you have the same thing in different parts of the app, you want it to look the same. 
And so the component guide enforces that you by using the same component and kind of restricting what customization you can do as opposed to kind of a lot of times you get a ticket and it's like for a button and what happens when we hover over the button? Should it get darker? Should it outline? I'll just do something. I'll just build some CSS and do it. And different engineers end up di building different kind of CSS all over the place and it's not consistent. This enforces a standard of style. And in fact, wouldn't it be cool if you hardly ever had to write CSS? <laughs> now some of you might like CSS. I kind of like CSS once you get to know it. But with a, with a good component guide, Almost all of your work is going to be just figuring out which components to use. The CSS has already been figured out by the building of the component itself. That's a, that's a cool world to think about. Um, also, a component guide allows for rapid prototyping and feedback. So you saw how fast I was able to whip up uh, a component into the guide for Ember Observer. Now, it so happens that Ember Observer, the development mode, still pulled in actual data. But a lot of times when you're first starting something, or you're first, maybe you're a new engineer and you haven't quite gotten everything set up with your development machine, the really cool thing is you can start building stuff right from the get-go. Once you get your Ember fired up, you don't need to worry about setting up your server correctly, figuring out how, how API calls work. Because the, the best components, again, as I said before, um, it's just, you can just stub some data out, pass it in, and the component should look good. So you can just start, start working right away, which is really cool. And then feedback as well. You can show it to UX designers. And that goes to my next point. Uh, it makes working with UX on changes really easy. You can literally sit down with a UX designer, have the component guide up. They're looking at that. You've got your Ember code up. Hey, you want to tweak this? I'm going to tweak it. Boom, live reload. It shows right up in the component. Really, really cool. It makes for really, really good communication. And then finally, as we saw with that little uh, CSS, with the UI and uh, the UL and the LI, the component guide exposes opportunities for refactoring. So the best components are really clean to build into the component guide. And as you're building it, oftentimes you, ex you expose those opportunities or you say, you know what? I could build this component better. I can see now, I've, it's been exposed to me that I can build this better and ultimately makes our application better. So in closing, I hope you learned something and are inspired today. Tomster wants to encourage you, go ahead and try it. In your application, if you, ha if you haven't used it before, fire up Ember Freestyle, try to component guide. Remember the Ember way and think in components. Thank you. <laughs>